Namasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Buddhang Dhammang Sanghang Namasami So I uh, thought I'd give this subject of death as the recollection this week, uh, I think starting Monday, and then found that all week people kept coming with uh, people in their lives who were dying or had died. Someone's friend from college passed, and she was up in Seattle cleaning out their apartment and came to alms. Uh, One of our members brought his grandmother's collection of thimbles today as a gift, and she just passed, Um, and many more uh, instances just in these last few days. And when the Buddha spoke about death contemplation, Maranānusati, he said that the deathless has its footing in contemplation of death. Contemplation of death is the path to the deathless. And Longpo Cha, famously taught that until we understand death, without understanding death, life is very confusing. So this bringing to mind uh, the situation and our brief moment here in the lives we have is essential, not just for learning to let go, but also for putting down those things in the world which aren't worthy of our hearts or our attention or our attachment. Because with death on one's mind and a clear recollection of it, so many of the desires and the habits and the resentments just seem utterly unimportant. If you're... uh, partner doesn't put away the dishes like they say they would. It just doesn't seem to matter that much when you realize that soon enough both of you will be dead. So when the Buddha spoke to the monks about death contemplation, he said, bhikkhus, how often do you contemplate death? How do you contemplate death? And many of you will know this sutta from the Anguttara Nikaya, and one monk pipes up and says, you know, every day I think how lucky I am to have at least this day to practice the Dhamma. And the Buddha says, you are heedless. And then another monk (laughs) begins, I know, you can sort of imagine the downcast monk. And so, hence follows a series of one-upsmans. But uh, the next monk says, you know, uh, in the course of, say, a few hours, I think, uh, how lucky I am to have this long to practice the Dhamma. And the Buddha says, you are heedless. And then another monk, I think, really, believing he's got it, says, you know, as long as uh, it takes to, um, I believe, uh, chew and swallow a mouthful of food, I think how lucky I am to have this long to practice the Dhamma. And the Buddha says, you are heedless. And then finally, a monk says, as long as it takes to inhale, and then as long as it takes to exhale, I think how lucky I am to have this long to practice the Dhamma. And the Buddha says, you are practicing correctly, bhikkhu. You are heedful. So it's a tall order. And yet, uh, in a quote I heard recently, life is a sexually transmitted disease with a 100% mortality rate. (laughs) So it's probably good to get our heads around this one. And I'm also reminded of a comic in The New Yorker where there's a bunch of pigs lined up for the slaughterhouse, and there's these two young pigs trying to climb out a window And there's these sort of older adult pigs lined up, and they say, kids these days, they just can't stand still. (laughs) So what contemplation of death does is it lets us not only learn that peace of letting go, what happens when you relinquish those entanglements and what that feels like, but it clarifies in our lives what is trivial and what is non-trivial. Uh, It helps winnow the chaff from the grain. 
And often when monks would come to the monastery I ordained at Wat Mapchan and weren't sure if they were going to ordain or not, the Buddha said, or uh, sorry, Longpur Anand said, <laughs> the Buddha said this too, but Longpur Anand said, contemplate death every day. Contemplate death every day. That will clarify. And in some sense, uh, depression is often a sort of wisdom people see the shallowness of the goals that are held up to them. Uh, and if the goal of life is a comfortable middle-class existence, that is a paltry goal for us. And not to say that that existence and that life can't be a path towards something greater, but we are worth far more than that. And this brief moment we have is worth far more. And this is what contemplation of death clarifies. Without understanding death, life can be very confusing. The Buddha says that just as uh, this life is brief, momentary, touched with suffering, one should touch this truth like a sage, practice the Dhamma. For one who is born, there is no freedom from death. Just as a drop of dew on a blade of grass quickly disappears with the sun's rise, just as a river rushing down a mountain, rushing onwards, never stops. Just as raindrops create a bubble for a brief moment in water before it disappears. Just as a stick drawn over water, the mark immediately disappears. Just as a cow led to slaughter with each step moves closer to its death. Even so, this life is brief, momentary, touched with suffering, one should touch this truth like a sage, practice the Dhamma. And so this is why us Theravadins get a reputation as being dour. But really what this does is it lets us get our priorities straight. And there is an immense poignancy and beauty that comes when you're able to put down all those things you know are unworthy of this brief moment you have and focus on what is actually worthy. Another useful, so when we look to what is worthy, it is this, uh, this practice. And in the face of death, of our mortality, the language of happiness um, often doesn't quite do the trick. Although it's true that the Dhamma is beautiful in the beginning, beautiful in the middle, beautiful in the end. But the language of, of duty and purpose carry enough weight to hold us through the difficulty of life and to justify uh, our mortality, to help us live a life worthy of our death. And that was the recollection that brought me to robes. What life is worthy of my death? You know, and I think most of us can live a good enough life, but the danger isn't often deep tragedy or diversion from our path. It's a steady dilution of our purpose and what we know we're capable of in this middle class existence. So coming back to uh, understand that we've been given this teaching, which is so precious and so rarely come upon and so needed in the world, the responsibility to carry that on, to give a gift of our lives to those around us, and the power of someone who's practicing to affect those around them is not something we should underestimate. It is rare. So if you can really dedicate this life to that, um, that's a purpose worthy of, of your death. And you will feel as you meditate more and more, the trivial and the non-trivial, you will feel when you're oriented sort of right, but not quite enough. And one uh, thing I like to remember sometimes is a beautiful uh, phrase from a very not beautiful movie um, on Samurai, when I watched one as a layman, and it's this student who approaches his master, and the master says, would you like to do a practice duel? 
and the student says, I'm saving my energy for something important, and the teacher says, there are no important or unimportant things. All things are equally important. And with Buddhism, because the quintessential element in awakening and moving the heart is uh, intention, we have the ability to imbue even the most mundane existence with something which is very much not mundane, which is transcendent and powerful, and to orient our lives in that direction and to practice well. This is exactly the situation where we should be. This is exactly the moment where we, where we should be grateful to have been manifest. And, you know, this can sound... Uh, fairly uh, trite or poetic, but if we really put teeth to that uh, determination and ground our lives in a daily meditation practice, make your way to monasteries, uh, take precepts when you're able, find a day a week that you're able to put aside to practice, then truly you can frame your life in such a way that you are living something that is, that is worthy um, of, of your death. And Longpur Anan, uh, my teacher, would, in meditation, uh, often anapanasati, uh, mindfulness of breathing, is just difficult to get our minds around. So using contemplation of death as a meditation object, it was his meditation object for the first four years, and it uses thinking to hamstring thinking. So you can come up with a phrase to kind of bring it to mind. Uh, it can be something as simple as death, death, all you have is now. Life is uncertain, death is certain, you will die. And just watch as this sword of wisdom just cuts off uh, every attempt of the mind to proliferate towards something unnecessary. And it can be a really powerful tool to have and to bring to mind every day, are you using this day, this life, in a way that's worthy? And this is what creates the word, the fifth feeling uh, we call some vega which is almost impossible to translate, but it's a mixture of alienation from our former goals that were so trivial, a sense of uh, sort of embarrassment at our own foolishness and buying into them, and a sense of urgency or faith towards something greater. And the difference between samvega, which is related to the word for wave, it's a wave that sweeps over you, uh, and depression is the fact that you have a path to channel yourself down. You have a way to orient your life and nothing else will, will fill, that, fill that spot. It's the great missing puzzle piece in, in all of us. So this contemplation of death, if kept as a daily mantra, even a momentary mantra, is of great benefit in learning to let go in clarifying our intention and in aligning our lives very clearly with uh, that one thing which is truly worthy of them. Um, so good luck to you all, and thank you for uh, doing the playing along with the meditation today. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. So we have some time for discussion and questions. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand and we can call on you, or you can type your question into the chat on YouTube or Zoom. And if you're here, then you can raise your normal hand and we'll have a mi mindful mic runner come to you. But we need a mindful mic runner. All right, cool. So yeah, any questions or things people would like to discuss? John, we got one over here. And uh, say your name first, if you would. Oh, okay. Sorry. There's a lot of hands going up. <laughs> Hi, I'm Seth. First of all, I hope I'm not alone in, in saying that that was really intense. <laughs> so thank you. Um, the other thing I, I thought of about a lot is um, some, I don't know where I read it. I think it probably Pema Chodron or something like that about the things that you do carry with you in this sense of letting go. So in the contemplation of the last five minutes, I spent 
some time talking about, you know, we were letting go of everything. And I was like, well, I don't want to let go of my generosity. Mm. And I don't want to let go of my commitment to service of mm. others. So I wanted to know what, what you thought about that and what the teachings have to say yeah, about you what to, you don't let go of. You get to keep those. Yeah. <laughs> um, good. No, no, that's, that's really good. And, and often I find that, that emptiness and that sort of clear emptiness you can come to it's imbued with that brightness, or at least that's the idea. And um, there's an amazing sutta where the Buddha says, uh, in the house that is ablaze, the vessel left inside will burn, whereas the vessel brought outside will be of use. Even so, when this life is burning with birth, aging, and death, or aging and death, that which is given will be of use. So this idea that what we give stays with us, everything else goes. Um, and yeah, the qualities of the heart, that's what we take. That's what we take with us. Those are provisions for the journey. And also, even if you don't believe in rebirth, um, there's this idea of sankara in Buddhism, which is a, a construct or a program of personality of anything. And there's wholesome sankara and unwholesome sankara. And what you put out in the world uh, in an impersonal sense, that is, it's a rebirth of sorts because you're putting out into the world goodness and how much goodness can you leave the world with when you leave, you know? So yeah, that, that stays with you. You get, to keep, you get to keep that one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to. <laughs> no, no, good. Thank you. Yeah, and I know it, it was an intense meditation. I hope it didn't throw people off too much, but... Hi, uh, Mike. Um, that was very, I had a lot less fear than I thought I would have at the end, you know, really picturing that it's, this is the end. Uh, so I just wanted to say that first. But the other thing is, um, well, I guess a technical question. <laughs> what, if there's no permanent self, if uh, everything just transient from moment to moment, what gets reborn? I mean, there's not a soul, right? And not man. And, uh, and what is it? It's just comma uh, impulses. I don't understand this at all. Yeah, no, you're not alone in that one. Anyone confused about this one? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I've been hitting most of the unpopular topics this last few weeks. So in our YouTube channel, there's a recent video called is rebirth real and it goes into this a bit, but you know, one of the uh, misconceptions is that uh, karma happens in the context of self. So there's this self traveling along with this karma, um, but that's not how Buddhism uh, conceives of it. It's, it's that self happens in the context of karma. So you have a continuity of habit pattern and craving, and one of those habit patterns is the creation of a feeling of a sense of self, uh, although that can manifest with different flavors at different times. We just happen to assume it's the same one every time. As to what uh, substrate that, uh, you know, when you have a mental, physical substrate, it's obviously the brain. Um, if one speaks about uh, the non-physicality, say, of actual rebirth, uh, as in a Buddhist conception, there's, um, who knows, energy or something like that. Um, but just to put it out there, you know, people often sort of get hung up on that just to point out how little we actually understand about how the world works in terms of quantum. And if, you know, if anyone sort of is priv sort of learned about the dissolution of Newtonian mechanics at the beginning of the 19th century under the, you know, barrage of experimentally verified evidence from quantum and how it's just mind blowing, we still don't, it's impossible to conceive of like the two slit experiment basically. Mm -hmm. So just to say there's a lot of the world which you don't kind of understand, but I don't know at all. And the Buddha was actually very clear about not getting too drawn into those questions. He said, you know, one way or the other, there is suffering in the end of suffering. So, yeah. Okay. It's a Thank good you. question. Good Thank question. You. Let me know if you figure that one out. <laughs> okay. Uh, person on Zoom who is my dad, I think. <laughs> Uh, I think you may be unmuted or not. Nope. Oh, try again. Now? Yep. Yep. We can hear you. Go for it. Okay. I just, uh, first of all, I wanted to um, agree that I was intense. 
and thank you for the meditation. And um, I don't really have a question, but it uh, it might have been one of the more liberating um, meditations that I've done. Um, so it was, it was really wonderful, and and um, looking forward to more of that. I'm glad. Yes, uh, where's Mindful Mike Runner? Yeah, back there. Oops, sorry. Right, um, <clears throat> thank you for the teaching. And I'll speak a bit of the, a bit more of the Dharma, uh, like a commentary or just like uh, some, some perspectives. So death is uh, simply impermanence, right? And there's nothing more than that. Uh, I mean, that's just my notes as I kind of contemplated on this and other teachers that I had. And impermanence is in all phenomena, right? Every moment, not just in our, you know, in ourself, in physical things and conceptual things as well, in our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And they just arise due to causes and conditions, right? Simply, just simply that. And they're impermanent by that very nature. And if we truly understand the, uh, what we kind of first label as like existence as dependent origination in that perspective, there is nothing to fear. I think that with death comes a lot of fear and it comes for me as well, quite naturally. And that as we, I think, heard today is just the natural state of one of our aggregates, which is the body, right? And it will just keep existing in different forms and you know, maybe nourish some plant or flower or just burn into ashes, go into ocean or something like that. And, and I like to kind of contemplate the forces that, you know, that um, causes and leads us and all sentient beings to liberation, you know, from cyclic existence. I mean, these things are kind of very, kind of related. So this is just, you know, um, our karma and other factors keeps us in cyclic existence. So there's no need to fear death. It's just a natural thing. And emptiness is not nothingness, mm -hmm. right? And there is nothing to fear in that regard. And I, you know, I'm just, I just love learning the, the wisdom and practicing compassion as the Dharma that I've just, you know, experienced so far. So uh, thank you for the, topic and the teachings today. I'm really glad. What's your name? Adi. Adi? Adi. Yeah, the, um, you know, the key insight uh, that is ushers into the first st st stage of awakening is that everything subject to arising is subject to ceasing, like everything changes. Um, the one thing that doesn't change is in the Buddhist idea is nibbana, nirvana. Um, and the difference between nibbana and God is that nibbana is not a causal principle. But you know, there's a point at the middle of your eye that you, it's always in the same spot, which is why you can't perceive it. So the only things we can perceive are those which are moving. Everything that is actually completely still, we can't see. So Ajahn Panyavada said, everything that exists isn't real, and whatever's real doesn't exist. Um, and Long Prapasana says, you know, Nibbana, enlightenment's right there, we just keep looking past it. So there is, everything is subject to change except one thing. And a lot of what Buddhism, the practice is, is trading more and more coarse and delicate and fragile sorts of refuge and happiness for more uh, refined and stable ones like samadhi or metta, but even those are impermanent in the end, yeah. Jean. Uh, go for it, if that is indeed Jean. <laughs> Yeah, go for Can it. you hear me? Yes, yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, Eugene is my name. Uh, thank you for this uh, subject matter. These are the waters that I am floating in right now. Uh, remember the five remembrances and uh, facing death. And, uh, I was really grateful for the guided meditation for the idea of letting go uh, which is uh, critical uh, gratitude for all that's happened uh, fills me with peace um, and using death as a sort of uh, a director for my thinking while i'm meditating is those are all um, important uh, concepts and uh, I intend to walk away from this meeting today with those uh, as intention in my practice. So thank you. Thank you, Eugene. Does anyone else want to say what came up for them? Or, or Steve, yeah, please. Uh, I, 
Mike. I have the mic. Oh, hey, mom. That's my mom. <laughs> <laughs> They're everywhere. <laughs> um, well, um, let's see. First of all, I was like, I was pretty mad at you. Like, wait a minute. I don't want to be in a room alone. Who, whose idea was this? <laughs> wait, wait, wait. No, 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 no. Not alone. <laughs> Took me a while to get over that. Then finally, uh, the, after a while, I was able to sort of conjure up this ball of goodness and uh, sort of light. And sort of the only thing I feel like I have to offer people really in my daily life is from the heart, you know. And so thought was more or less away, but I still had to take a lot of effort to make this shiny thing <laughs> that I wanted to take to the next adventure, whatever it was, after dying. And, uh, but I couldn't, when I had to let go of that effort, that had to go too. And instead, there was still this sensation around the heart, but it was completely porous hmm. and soft. And that was a surprise, and it was a, it was a beautiful surprise. So, thank you. Try to be in your room when you die, Mom. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and you too on that screen. <laughs> uh, Joseph and then Steve. Oh, I'm just, I just like your mom got it. It was so great. She was mentioned the ball of light and having to give that up too. And so I was just like, I was like, oh, this met. I was like, if I'm dying, I hope I'm just filled with meta. And then I was like. But then metta's not mine either. But there's this beautiful quality about metta where it's like when you realize metta's not yours, it's like, I can give this away. And so I was so happy that your mom noticed that with the, with the, with the, the light in the chest. And that's just something that came up to me. It was like, like one, like if <laughs> it's just, there's this feeling. I remember this movie I watched where um, it was a Sherlock Holmes movie and Sherlock Holmes in order to uh, save Watson has to realize that he has to, the only way he can defeat Moriarty is by uh, grabbing him and, and pulling him off the ledge into the waterfall. And there's a scene where you see them both falling into the abyss and Moriarty is screaming. He's like, ah! and then, but Sherlock Holmes is so peaceful because he gave the gift of safety to his friend. Like the last thing he did was he gave a gift. And the other one, and you could see the two minds have, like, if we, if we cultivate a mind of goodwill, of metta, then letting go is a gift because we're giving that goodness away. And so that's just what I feel inspired to share. Thank you, Joseph. The, uh, the enlightened mind is compared to light that lands on nothing. So this idea that when you let go of stuff or, you know, all these conceptions, there's still you know, there's, there's a luminosity. Um, Steve. Uh, howdy folks. Uh, related to this, let's see, um, personally I've, in terms of this exploration of death, I've been interested in NDE, near death experience world for many, many years. And uh, this afternoon there's a NDE person who, who had an NDE giving a presentation at the Wallingford Center at one o'clock. The International Association of Near-Death Experience, one of the biggest chapters in the Seattle area. And it's, it's really extraordinary. It's a whole authentic world of people. And what it's a, done for me is it's loosened up my sense of stiffness in, in a complementary way around uh, attaching to this lifetime. What it means in terms of the continuity and how that works, I don't know. But it, it's, it is complementary, and I think it's, it can be for some people uh, uh, complementary to what we've been talking about, yeah. Talk to Steve if you want a field trip after this, yes. <laughs> and, and life is a near-death experience, for the record, so, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, one more comment or whatever came up for people. Hmm? Who? Oh, Sam's got one. There is. Oh, I don't know. Sam? <laughs> it Sam, could be me. go for it. <laughs> Hello, I'm Sam. And I think to a certain degree it was difficult for me to take it seriously for myself. I was like, okay, this is kind of silly. I'm going to die in five minutes. Um, but it did forgive me, partner. <laughs> it started to feel more real when my partner said it. It was like, I saw the other person was going to die in five minutes. That was like, 
I better listen then. <laughs> <laughs> um, for death contemplation, is there that sort of awareness of your own or others or, yeah, just sort of exploration around awareness of others' death, I guess. Yeah, Long Por Sumedho has a story of going to Thailand out in the Navy, and uh, he asked the Buddhist monk there what, um, the Buddhist monk, a Buddhist monk asked him what angels were like in America, and he said, well, you know, they've got these halos, they've got wings, they're dressed in robes with a harp, and he's like, what are angels like in, in Buddhism? And the monk said, well, it's uh, aging, sickness, and death. <laughs> and and uh, the in, in the suttas, these are called the Deva Dutta, the heavenly messengers. Um, and uh, basically, they're supposed to be these reminders to practice, like this is what matters. So in the suttas, it's really recommended that whenever um, you see someone ill or sick or dying, you know, it, uh, you, you remember this will be, this will be me. Um, and there's another sutta where the Buddha says, like, there's a few different sorts of monastic. There's one that is like a horse where it sees a whip and starts to run. And that's like a person who hears about someone who's gotten sick or died and begins to practice. And then there's the horse that feels the whip and begins to run. And that's like someone who someone in their family gets sick or dies, and so they start to practice. And then there's a horse that it needs to strike to the bone before they start to run. And that's like someone when you've gotten sick, and then they start to practice. So the idea is you want to be the horse that just has to see the whip. Um, <laughs> so yeah, bringing it in, bringing it in, um, and seeing, it, seeing dead bodies. It's, it's kind of absurd, the schizophrenia of our culture, how carefully we hide away a corpse. You know, in Thailand, it's so much healthier. Like, the body's there, people have a ceremony, they, um, you know, it's just such a m much more wholesome relationship with death, so, yeah, I think, yeah. Thank you, Bonte. Yeah.